All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is August 29th, 2023, and this is going to be the third and final piece, I am certain of it, of Romans in the Prophetic. The first was glorious and conquering. We got from chapter 1, I believe, to 8. Uh, the second one, a remnant seed. The continuation, like a part 2, where we went from Romans 8 to Romans 11. And today will be number 3. We will close it out. We'll put all of the connections together. And in fact, as we get started, we're going to start in Romans 1. And we're going to go all the way through the chapters, the, the main ones that we covered. Maybe even touch on a couple other points. Just some key points that we, that we saw in the prophetic in relation to the group it's speaking to. We know that Romans is speaking to the church, is speaking to, to the bride, the, the pre-trib group. We know that this is being spoken to, but we could also see through the prophetic revelation and the understanding of the is to come, through all of the open books over the last several years here in this ministry, we're now able to even go into Romans and show all of this prophetic is to come. We, we can see what it's telling us in typologies for a remnant worker bride portion that will remain to bring in the great multitude that will work during seals to bring in the Gentile church until the end of seals and the fullness of the church is over. The fullness of the Gentiles will be over at that point. And so we're going to touch on some of these by, by recapping some of the main points, and then we're going to finish it off and when we do, man, it's so exciting. I know many of you feel the same way. It gets really, really exciting to be able to see this kind of insight into the is to come. And as we close out this final portion and you see more things, the way we're able to see these things that we're going to talk about in the later portion as we get into the final chapters is because of the things we discovered in the earlier chapters. So, you know, one of the great ones was um, Romans 9.23 and, and the message that, that, that's just right in that verse. Well, it's going to help us at the end of Romans prove the point even more as to who this group is right in the chapter where it literally talks about who this group is rep represented by, as many of you guys have known and heard over the years as well um, in Romans 16. But there's even more detail that confirms that now for us. So it's exciting. We're going to have some fun. As usual, I'm going to start off right off the bat. For anybody that's new to the ministry, you're going to hear things like you might have just heard now where, where I say that, you know, uh, at the end of seals or, you know, in, in that seventh year of seals, you're going to think, what is he talking about? Well, that's because you're going to realize the truth of the revelation of the end of days is 14 years. Paul talks about it. It's all throughout the scriptures. But the only way you're really going to understand it. Now, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and read it for yourself in the prophetic. Read Paul in an understanding of the is to come in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And understand that in Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says the thing that was. So Old Testament is the thing that shall be, meaning is to come in the, in the, in the end of days. The thing that is, which is what we're living now from Christ until the pre-trib escape. That's the is. Well, that would be Romans and so forth as well. Is and Corinthians is there's a picture in it of the is to come as well. What shall what was shall be, what is shall be. And that's when you realize that the things there are things in the Old Testament and typologies, right? The here a little, there a little. So you're going to get things in typologies of the Old Testament, things in typologies of the New Testament, and they are both giving us details into understanding the prophetic, the prophetic revelations of the is to come. And so when you go with that understanding into uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and look at what Paul is saying with prophetic end time eyes, you're going to see, just as we did, that Paul is telling us that there's a period of 14 years and a little bit above that we've revealed is 50 days. That is the end of days. The 50 days will start with the pre-trib escape. There's a number of events that happen during those 50 days. And then it will be seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. 
In fact, you can go to some of our recent shorts. So if you're new to the ministry, <laughs> look at today's. That Oh, that's awesome, man. <laughs> I hate it. That That's the best word so far. <laughs> I can't believe I had no choice. I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't change them on these. But it, it's, man. All right, it's funny. <laughs> I hope you're having a laugh. But um, come and listen. These are all just shorts. So this is literally un a minute or less. You can take a minute or less. You go through six of these. Take you six minutes or less, okay? And begin to understand what some of these differences are because it all begins with understanding who the Gospels are speaking to. And to do that, there's two places you can go. You can go right here on YouTube to this playlist right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series. Um, there's, what, 12 videos in there. But the first four are the main focus. Study them, take your time, seek them, discern them, pray over them, and you will begin to see the end of days revealed in Scripture as it has never, ever been revealed before. And we've been doing it here now for six years since my life changed on September 8th of 2017. And I've been doing it now for five and a half years, uh, a little over five and a half years now, full time. So... The other place you can come is here. You can go to ministryrevealed.com, click on the menu, go to the intro, and it'll take you to this page. So those first four videos are also here on this page and with others as well. This intro video is a 22-minute video that gives you a brief overview of the next three videos. Okay, Same with the one on the YouTube playlist. You're going to begin to understand in this intro that will lead you into what the other three are talking about what is this revelation we talk about in the gospels it's called who the gospels are speaking to and you're going to understand these differences that people thought have been contradictions for centuries are actually prophetic revelations there they were prophecy built in for us to understand something simple is like if you go to luke in the synoptic gospels you're going to go to luke and you're going to see that Jesus, before going to the cross, was arrayed in a gorgeous white robe. So gorgeous means white, radiant, beautiful, like a bride would wear. You go read Mark, and it says it, he was arrayed in purple. And you go read Matthew, and it says he was arrayed in scarlet. You see Jesus' last words on the cross in Luke is, into your arms I commend my spirit. But in Mark and in Matthew, it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And forsaken means leave behind. We know Jesus wasn't worried about being left behind. So what was he saying? Why are they only in Mark and Luke? And the answer is prophecy. Purple and scarlet for Mac and Mark and Matthew are prophetic end time colors. The woman riding the beast is wearing purple and scarlet. Those are tribulation colors. Luke's is not. And so you're going to be able to understand more and more. These first two videos, the who the Gospels are speaking to, and what it reveals about the end of days, you'll see that the discourses are spoken of differently, very different in Luke, a little bit different in Mark, and then it's even twice as long in, in Matthew, is because the truth is when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to realize that it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And so this is a 30-minute intro video to begin to give you an understanding of it. It's a 30-minute Bible study begins to reveal it for you. This is a 30-minute Bible study, uh, all from Scripture, breaking down in a 30-minute intro of it the revelation of the 14 years and begins to prove it out for you. This one here is the big one. This one's about 2 hours and 45 minutes. And this is the insight as to how it was all missed. And the reason is exactly as the title says, it's all because of Matthew. We have all been taught from the foundation of the gospel of Matthew. So all we see are the seven years to Judah, which are the seven years of trumpets. And we've missed the first seven years of seals that come for the church and for the world that's asleep, that isn't prepared, the, the church that's not prepared, the church that's still living in their ways. They're not watching. They're not repentant. They're not diligent. They're still set in their ways. And we read about it all throughout Scripture. Even Romans talks about it. We probably will touch in a couple places that say it as well. And so 
they're going to go through seals. And so there's seven years of seals and there's seven years of trumpets, but we've only seen seven because everything we've ever been taught has always been from the foundation of Matthew. And we've been told in the Synoptic Gospels with Mark and Luke that they're just perspective. Well, they're not because the revelation of the is to come is all about the differences in those Gospels. And if you don't understand it, all you see is seven years. And those seven years are the seven years of Judah, which are the seven years of trumpets. So when people say, ah, everybody in the church goes pre-trib and they only believe seven years of tribulation, it's because they're at the end of seals where you find in Revelation chapter 7, at the end of the sixth seal, before the seventh, you see the great multitude rapture. Hello. The answer is who the Gospels are speaking to. It reveals the revelation of the end of days, which is 14 years and a little bit of 50 days above. And the reason we've never seen it before is because it was held by the Lord to be revealed for the final generation, to be revealed in the time of the end. And the answer is be all because of Matthew. From there, you can go into deeper stuff. This one is a three-hour teaching on the first one of who the Gospels are speaking to. This is the revelation of the discourses. So in the end, you're going to see, so the, discor the, the Gospels in the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But you're going to be able to understand that the first will be last and the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. All of these things start to make sense and come to light. It's going to reveal that pre, mid, and post are all true. All of this and so much more. And when you read, don't forget, when you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you're going to see that everything 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is saying is pre, mid, post. First one of the third heaven, second one goes to paradise, third one is him returning to them. It's a picture of the Lord, first group pre-trib, second group mid-trib, third group is him returning to them, feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. All right, so that's where it's best for everyone to start. Now, as we keep going, I wanted to also share with you guys or share and ask you guys for those of you now, nobody has to do this. I'm just putting it out there if anybody would like to do it. And that is, what I was thinking of some ways that maybe we can get these out more. We can reach more people with them. And I know for some people, you know, oh, a three-hour video or a two-hour video isn't really going to get a lot of people's attention. Well, that's why we did the shorts. And that's why I'm going to continue to do, do the shorts every day for the foreseeable future, but they'll probably eventually go to one every second day because I'm probably going to start doing in between the shorts, in between the full teachings like tonight's. I'm also going to most likely get into doing shorter videos like like a 10, maybe probably 15 minute time frame that can kind of build on some of these shorts. So what I would ask for those who would like to, no pressure, is that if you have a YouTube channel, and you're not doing anything with it, or it's just being shared with family and friends, or you just have one, and so you go watch other people's videos and so forth, why not take the shorts videos, put one up a week, or one up every couple days, or every time I put one up, just go post, go copy it, and go post it on your channel as well. So I just thought of that as an idea, and I mean, with the few thousand that are watching, if we had several hundred possibly, maybe, hopefully, prayerfully, that how, imagine how many more we'd be able to reach with so many of you in all different parts of the world. I think we'd be able to reach many, many, many more people by getting these shorts. And then if, if you have these shorts, but you want to you wanna reach other or you want to get other videos as well, then you can just come take the videos from Ministry Revealed. There's no, there's no condition or anything. You can take any video and share it anytime you want. And just take the ones that you want and just start posting them on your channel. You can leave the comments open. You don't have to respond to them. You can respond. You can direct them to Ministry Revealed, whatever you want to do. But I just thought it was a great way. It just dawned on me uh, yesterday as I was pondering these things and uh, thought it would be a great way that maybe we can uh, use that to reach more people. All right. So with that, 
let's get this going now i'm going to close this because this takes up a lot of energy all right give me a second here i'm going to take a sip of coffee so remember what we're talking about and what we're seeing is romans in the prophetic so all i wanted to start with as i said is we're going to go into romans and oh hold on a second i almost forgot see sometimes i make little notes before starting and thank goodness i did because i wanted to show you guys something i shared it in the forum today it was shared with uh one of our brothers uh he sent me an email about it i, I don't know if it was yesterday or today i think it might have been today and i want to share it with you but i'm going to start why is it doing that oops because i'm in the wrong spot <laughs> <laughs> hello there we go so first of all here's something i wanted to show you guys um that many of you here already know but this is fragment five in the apocryphal book so it's the apocryphal fragments and this is fragment five so for anybody that's new what i was just talking about in second corinthians and telling you to go read second corinthians with an end time understanding this here in this fragment five of the apocrypha is confirming that what Paul was saying was true. So even though it doesn't say 14 years, by saying what it does say, it's confirming to us that what Paul said was true. So if Paul starts with 14 years and above, then that means the other parts are true as well. And look at what it says. As the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of Paris, paradise and others will possess the splendor of the city for everywhere the savior will be seen according as they will be deemed worthy to see him that's the rest of the other page so i wanted to share that to show you one example of the many places we have gone in the apocryphas to not prove not not to use the apocrypha and then go try to prove it out in scripture but where we have proven things out in scripture and then people have found things in the apocrypha and shared it with us and this one was from our sister um tanya and she was the one that that recommended and bought the book uh the 54 uh the 54 book uh apocrypha and i just recently got it as well so it was great when you see what our brother shared with me today this is one example that that proves out so if one goes to heaven one goes to paradise and the other is him coming to the city well, that's precisely what Paul said, and he said that it would be a portion above and over 14 years. All right? So there's more evidence for us, even though it's even more throughout Scripture. Well, now I'm going to show you another one. I had never heard of this apocrypha, apocrypha before. It's called Didach, and I, I opened up the 54-book apocrypha that I have, and it was there. And it was a video that our brother shared with me today. I went through it and it was awesome so much of it sounds like luke now i didn't go through the whole thing i was listening to the video short video he sent me and it was the focus on chapter 16 proving that pre-trib is true now what you're going to see is and i don't know if the guy went on further into the video because you know if i get the insight as to where it is i'm going to go seek and search it out for myself so that's what i did and you see that it talks all luke language which is pre-trib and then it goes at the end of this in the final verse this the whole thing here just this is one chapter is the final chapter chapter 16 and it tells us of pre mid and post at the end so listen to what it says watch over your life so this is like what luke 16 uh uh, uh luke 21 verse 36 like watch ye therefore and pray always right watch over your life do not let your lamps be quenched do not let your loins be ungirded, but be ready. This is all Luke conversation. This is this let your loins be girded and be ready is is Luke um, chapter uh, 12, right? When he says he's about to go to the wedding. So in one case, yes, it, it's a picture of Luke with the entirety of the pre-trib, but we also know that there's a group within the pre-trib, a, a remnant bride that's going to remain to serve the Lord. You're going to see that confirmed even more today as we get into Romans. But you can see that's the conversation going on here. And it says, for you have not, uh, uh, for you have not known the hour in which the Lord comes. So what do we see? 
the hour, not the day or hour, only hour. And let me show you this. We know this one really well. If we go into Luke chapter 12, again, this is more even of a conversation of after the bride is gone and it's his remnant worker bride where he says, let your loins be girded about, look at that, and your lights burning as if he's talking to his remnant bride that are going to serve him. Okay, that when he returns for your from the wedding, you will open immediately. Then he says the second watch and the third watch. That's the end of seals, the 144,000 for trumpets. And then the third watch is the end of trumpets for the millennial rain workers. That's the three watches. And listen to what it says in 1239. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. You see that? There are those that will be watching and ready. They may not know the hour, but they're in the vicinity. They might even know the day. Not the day and hour that Mark talks about. Not the day and hour that Matthew talks about. But I want you to remember something. Because as I continue to read this, you're going to see something in the pre, the mid, and the post that will help blow your socks off in a simple, one simple final verse of chapter 16. It's everything we've been sharing about pre, mid, and post. Let's continue. But be frequently gathered together. We are. Seeking the things which are profitable for your souls for the whole time of your faith will not profit you except you be found perfect at the last time. For in the last days, the false prophets and the corruptors will be multiplied and the sheep will be turned into wolves and the love uh, and love will change to hate. For as lawlessness increases, they will hate one another and persecute and betray. And then the deceiver of the world will appear as the son of God and will do signs and wonders and the earth will be given over into his hands and he will commit iniqui iniquities which have never been seen since the world began then uh then the creation of mankind will come into fiery trial and many will be offended and be lost but they who endure in their faith will be saved but the uh, uh by the curse itself and then will appear the signs of truth. Listen to this. Here's pre, mid, and post. Let me zoom it in. There we go. Listen carefully. First, the sign spread out in the sky. Do you know what the sign spread out in the sky is, brothers and sisters? We've been talking about it many times here in this ministry. It's going to be the Revelation 12 sign. This has not happened. The sign of it, which is six years ago almost, it was the sign to prepare. I believe it's the first seven years marker. And then there's seven and seven more to come of seals and trumpets. You see, it's, just, it's something that's going to be looked at with eyes wide open as something remarkable. Not simply voluntary observation which it was in revelation chapter 12 in 2017 this is the sign that is going to be in the sun the moon and the stars what is this thing that that is going to be seen in the sky well we know it's a meteor the meteor that's probably going to break up and be in parts and pieces it's exactly Luke 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud, singular, with power and great glory. This is the pre-trib beginning. It's the Revelation 12 sign. Well, that's precisely what it just said. The first one is what? The sign spread out in the sky. Many people have also had um, uh, visions and dreams 
of this guy. I've I've heard of like five or six close brothers, pastor that I that we know of just through YouTube and others that have seen like swirling colors like a rainbow causing everybody to look up like what is going on? And then bam, the escape happens and we know then that'll probably be the meteors breaking through and so forth. Okay? That's the first one. Exactly as we're expecting according to Luke 1. Well, listen to what it says next. And this should knock your socks off. Here's the second one. Then the sign of the sound of the trumpet. Why do you think the second will be the sound of the trumpet? You guys already know this one, right? You know why it's going to be? Because the 14 years will begin at the Feast of Trumpets. And after six days, the first six years come to an end, it will be the Lord coming to begin the seventh year when he's seen at the end of the sixth seal. And then what happens? The Mark discourse, the day and hour no one knows. The Feast of Trumpets, the sounding of the shofar, the blowing of the trumpet when the Lord is seen coming by those who will see him coming in the clouds, those who are his at the end of seals that will be part of the great multitude rapture. When is he coming? Brothers and sisters, we've already been teaching that it is going to be the Feast of Trumpets. And what is it? Then the sign of the sound of the trumpet. Well, how about the third when he returns? And thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. Oh, wait a second. See, I told you, Alan, everybody is resurrected from the dead. Nope. But not all of the dead. Hello. Of course not all of the dead. Right? Of course not all of the dead. We know who they are. The first group of them, there, there's two portions, right? There's going to be the ancient, right? The, the ancient Hebrews and stuff that were promised their millennial reign. But who else is going to be a part of it? This group. Those who put their necks on the line, who are they? That's the group we're going to be talking about in Romans, right? That's the group. That's that remnant Gentile bride. The, the first group is taken to the third heaven, and this group would have been part of them, but they were chosen by the Lord to remain and serve him. They are his serving Gentile bride for the time of seals to bring in the Gentile church, the fullness of the Gentiles. And they're going to be putting their necks on the line. We know them as Smyrna. We know them as Luke 24. We know them as Priscilla and Aquila. This is them. Those who put their necks on the line. Didn't take the mark of the beast. Never worshipped the beast. They're going to be what? They're going to be resurrected. Remember? Neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, meaning not all the dead are raised yet until the end of the millennial reign, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So who has part in the first resurrection? Those who his servant bride who remained, who put their necks on the line to bring in the rest of the Gentiles. Well, isn't that funny? And thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. But... Not all of the dead, uh, uh, but as it was said, the Lord will come and all his holy ones with him. Now listen to this. Then the world will see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, how appropriate is that? You see, this is another one of those chapters in the Apocrypha, another one of those books where we have proven these things from Scripture, and bam, we're able to turn around and prove them out in understanding in those prophetic books. What do we know about it? Well, everybody knows this one well. And in fact, it's, it's the first or second short that I did. I think it was the first short video that I did. In Luke's discourse, when he's coming, when the Son of Man is coming for the pre-trib group, it says um, in Luke 21, verse 27, Shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud singular? You see? In a cloud singular. You go to Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, it's not the same. People think they were just discrepancies. They weren't. 
They're different portions of time. It says, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, plural. In cloud, in clouds, plural. Neither of these, see, these are both in. Neither of them are on. So that means the last time we should find it in Matthew, when Matthew is speaking to Judah in the final seven years, that when he's coming and returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, let's see what it says. Where is it? Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Oh, wait a second, Alan. That sounds like the same as Matthew's, in the clouds. Oh, wait a second. This one is G1722, where the word in means in, just like Luke's, in. Look at what Matthew's means. G1909. That's not the same. Why? Because it means on. When they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, plural. What is the third one? Then the world will see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. Let me show you this. I'm going to finish it with that. But let me show you this one connection. I'm going to do a, a, a clip on this and uh, probably a short on this as well. I mean, a, 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 a short video as well. This is Daniel chapter 7. Okay? You see the lion, the bear, the leopard, the beast that gets now his power. And he's going to reign. This is till the end of seals. Most people don't realize this. This is till the end of seals. The, the ancient of days did sit. Um, the Antichrist, the beast is killed. And then one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. You see? To the ancient of days and dominion was given to him. So this is when the Son of Man becomes uh, a Melchizedek, king and high priest. This is the end of seals, and he's going to be here for the first half of trumpets. This is why everybody's so mixed up with Matthew, where they think it's Antichrist who's going to build the temple. It is not. Antichrist is going after the temple of the flesh, not a physical temple yet. He's going after the Christians, not a physical temple. That is during trumpets seven years. This is the end of seals. Want me to prove it to you? One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Would have been easy if it said in the clouds of heaven and it meant in, right? Well, let's have a look and see. What does with the clouds of heaven mean? Like, to, with. Well, that's not very helpful. So let's see a deeper root word of what it means. In, in the clouds of heaven. Hello. That's because this is the end of seals. This is Mark's in the clouds, plural. It is the end of seals, brothers and sisters. So these are the types of things that you're going to come to understand and learn here in this ministry and be able to discern if you're new by starting with those four videos. All right. It's awesome. It is so beautiful. It changes your scripture life because when you read, you understand more than you ever have before. And you're doing it in the perspective of prophecy. Oh, sure, it helps give us clarity of things in the was. It helps give us clarity to the things in the is. But the real purpose is for revealing and understanding and being prepared for the is to come of prophecy. If that wasn't important, why would Revelation chapter 19 tell us this? Verse 10, halfway through. Um... I am of thy brother and testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, brothers and sisters. Prophecy. We are coming into the end of days. We are in the first seven of the final three sevens. And I believe we've got about a year to go. Well, we'll say about 11 months, <laughs> maybe 11 months and a half to go. All right. But don't worry, we'll be here with you the whole way through. We'll be sharing and digging and doing all sorts of things uh, to reveal and get greater understanding of the scriptures. All right. So let's just do a quick little rehash uh, of some of these things that we've covered. And we'll start in Romans one. We're not going to cover everything. Obviously, we couldn't even do everything in two videos. So we're just going to touch on some key points in Revelation. I mean, in uh, Romans chapter one, in verse 20, we see. For the invisible things of him 
from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Okay, where you see verse 21 because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as, as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. You see, we know we've taught on this. We know it relates to the days of creation. This group that was created in light in the days of creation. It wasn't the Adam and Eve group. They were the ones created in flesh. This is a group of males and females that were the light portion after Christ was made light in uh, Genesis 1 verse 3. Okay. And there was the fallen ones that, that, that they went. They were part of doing this with the Lord and they fell. And when they fell, they they came to worship this image that they had made more so than the creator okay, more so than our Lord and the father who gave it all to him to go and create. And it says in verse 23 and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men. Verse 24, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own. Uh, through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Because this is all about the the Mark group, the, the church that's not prepared, the church that's still living in the world. Remember, there's there's an is of this right now, but we're looking at it through the is to come. And even when we go a little bit further in, when we get into like the, the teens, of Romans, you're going to see things that we can read and apply in our lives of the is right now and probably even see it and understand. And it's probably very practical for right now, even though we can say looking at it, it it's going to be applicable to the servants in the is to come. However, that's almost going to seem obvious at that point. But we can also look to apply it to the is in our lives right now as well. So this this is about those who were corrupted, those those who were who were fooled by this changing of the truth of God into a lie. Those who either don't believe, those who are uh, those who are asleep, those who are in the church but just living their own lives. Okay, that's what's going on here. We've we've covered a lot of this. Let's go to Romans two. Ah, yes, Romans two. This was a big deal, right? Um, in verse three, so we won't cover it all of it, all of it. Like I said, in Romans two, verse three, and, and thinkest thou this, O man that judges them, which do such things and doest the same that thou should escape the judgment of God. You see, you can't go around condemning and judging other people when in some cases you might even be doing the same thing. We're not to judge. We're to pray for, we're to lift up. You're going to see a lot of that in Romans, right? We're not to, supposed to speak against our neighbors. We're, we're not supposed to speak down or belittle. Yes, we're in the flesh and yes, we're human. But in Christ, spirit filled, we have to do a better job. I'm, I'm thankful nobody's in my car with me a lot of times. <laughs> I'm not a big cursor or anything, but, you know, I've always been a driver and I used to drive a lot. And so... Um, you know, I don't have much patience, but that's a place where I work, uh, where I work on a lot. I'm learning to bite my tongue. And so my thoughts stop, you know, <laughs> so I'm sure some of you can relate, but obviously this is, uh, in a, in a bigger picture of all sorts of things as well. Right. So essentially it's saying, don't judge because if you turn around and do those same things, how are you to think you're going to escape? You see that you're going to escape this word for escape to flee out is the exact same one from Luke 21, 36, okay? So we have to be careful and cautious to be lifting up and not tearing down, right? Not judging. Uh, three, okay, da, 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 da. oh yeah, this is a good one. Romans 3, verse 24 and 25, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth, okay, purposed, placed before to be a propetition through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through forbearance of God, okay? 
So just about Christ Jesus, he, he justified it for us. And remember, when we get to Romans, uh, uh, when we go further into Romans, we see that there's a group who is what? Who, who have been justified. Who were chosen before the foundation of the earth. So who is a part that's chosen, who's already been justified from before the foundation of the earth? It was Christ, of course. But guess what? It's also those who are co-heirs with Christ. Crazy, right? Unbelievable. Not obviously to Christ, but we are co-heirs with him. And we wouldn't be so foolish to think that, right? Could you imagine? We've got, a, we've got a scripture in Romans that tells us that we are co-heirs. So those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, are co-heirs, chosen before the foundation of the earth, co-heirs with Christ. And people think, many people think, that Jesus is God the Father. Isn't that wild? I used to be one of them years ago. My wife, too, she, years ago, before we met, way before, when she was a teenager, had always questioned, why is Jesus God the Father? Why is he always praying to himself? And why is he telling everybody to, to pray to his Father? I mean, you go to Romans and you see it. I mean, if, you, if you're saying you're a co-heir with Christ, then you're saying you're a co-heir with God the Father over everything. Well, I might need to put you in a loony bin. <laughs> All right. But, you know, again, I'm I'm not tr I'm not judging. I'm just saying the scriptures are revealing. We need to be diligent in understanding what the word is telling us. And if you go to Revelation, I mean, Genesis chapter one, verse one and two, I did a short on that just briefly as well. I don't know if it came out yet or tomorrow. But again, it's it, when you understand these things that pre mid and true are true, that. It's 14 years and a portion called above of 50 days that it's the revelation of the differences of who the Gospels are speaking to. You'll realize these things that there is the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. There are three beings that work in perfect harmony as one. But there's three beings. Christ isn't sitting on the side of himself in heaven. He's sitting on the right side of the Father. And if we go to Genesis one, we read in Genesis one, one. In the beginning, God created that word beginning means Jesus. It means the first fruits of the feast of first fruits, which is the one without leaven, the one without sin. It was only Jesus. He's the only one. So it means in Jesus, God created. So you have the son who was given it to create it all. And he was given it from the father. Exactly like Romans told us. And then in verse two, you see in the spirit of God was over the waters so you have the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. You see, why is this important? Because you're going to go read things like in Rome, in uh, Revelation 16, verse 13, and you must have questioned it if you believe seven years and you believe that Satan is the Antichrist and Antichrist is Satan, that they're the same character, you must be really scratching your head or you must skip over Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, because it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Three beings coming out, uh, three frog-like spirits coming out of three beings. Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Hello. You'll be able to understand these things here. All right? It's awesome. Let's keep going. Let's see what I had for four. Did I have, oh, yeah. The, the counted and accounted was really exciting as we went through that. We touched on that in uh, Romans 4, right? And, and how it led us into this be accounted. And we were showing what this difference was with this be accounted. Because this be accounted is, is the portion, like we see here, be accounted worthy, be accounted worthy, be accounted. So in the Old Testament, we see it as be accounted. Look at this. It's only in Luke. And yes, it's purposeful. It's only in Luke because it relates to those who are account, who will be accounted worthy to escape all these things. It led us to the word seed, that he has a remnant portion, a remnant seed which is exactly this stuff that we're talking about with Romans. 
this remnant bride portion who is going to help bring in the great multitude rapture, who is going to help bring in those of the fullness of the church, the fullness of the Gentiles. And we covered that as well. So we'll go to Romans 5. Look at this. In Romans 5, sip of coffee. We've got a hot one here tonight. It's not going to last too long, though. You can see it down here, 26. Oh, we got some smoke again. 26 at 8, 18 p.m. in Calgary. That's hot, man, for Calgary. All right, listen to this. In Romans 5, this is really interesting. So, again, in Romans 5, this is a little bit of insight to be able to see it in the is to come. Now, when you read in Romans 3, and we see, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Now, in the is, this is really straightforward. In the is, tribulation is the things that we have to endure and sometimes go through in life. But in the is to come, you see this persecution, tribulation, trouble, burden? Do you know, see how that's used twice here? It's interesting. It just, it repeats it, right? In tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. It's almost like a little hint, seals and trumpets, in relation to seeing it in the is to come. Do you know why? Because Luke, in his entire gospel, does not have the word tribulation or even the definition of the word. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't, it, it might use the word tribulation, it might use pressure, it might use persecution, but it all relates to this number. It doesn't even appear in Luke's gospel. Remember how we showed that with other words that only appear in Luke and their significance or only in Mark and their significance? This is the same type of thing. So what are we seeing here? There's, there's a tribulation that a group will glory in knowing what the purpose is and the hope in the end of it. That's the is to come insight, the tribulation that will come in the is to come. Okay, so that was an interesting one. Then there's this Romans 513 for until now. Uh, sorry, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. You see that there was no reckoning for sin until there was law. Okay, so. Until Moses, even though there was sin and people were dying because of Adam, there, there, there was sin in the world, but the Lord can't account for it. There, there's no reckoning, reckoning. It wasn't put on account. So a lot of people say, well, how are Adam and all of those that fell in sin, how are they going to, you know, be in heaven? What's going to be their judgment? You know, and, and right up through Noah and everything else. What's going to be the judgment for these guys? Well, We'll leave that up to God. But there wasn't, there was, even though there was sin going on, there was no law to hold account sin. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Nevertheless, death reigned. Okay? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, uh, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of of him that was to come well what do we know jesus is jesus called you know some people say the second or the last adam well look at what it says he must have looked exactly like him is it possible i mean we can't really know you see what i'm saying we don't we don't really know if he if he looked identical we see a lot of things in scripture that are twins but look at this a die as struck. My wife is a huge crafter. I know exactly what dies are, right? Dies and you put it through the machine and you can make one after the other after the other. They're exactly the same, okay? As a model, print, pattern, figure, manner. Interesting, wasn't it? So, and we know that Jesus, of course, was the last Adam. So, interesting that we see he might have actually been a twin, but what would it really matter? I mean, nobody would really know. You know what I'm saying? But it's interesting that it's there. Um, let's see. What else? No condemnation. Yeah, let's read verse 16. 
and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man offense, one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's almost like they're on opposite ends, as we all know. Okay, one in disobedience, one in obedience. Let's see, what do I have for six? Oh, yes. Six is a good one as well. I'm not even sure if we touched on it uh, in the last one, but I want to touch just on this part right here. Uh, Romans 6, 3 through 5. Know, you, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ as, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. You understanding what I'm saying? Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. A lot of people don't believe you need to be water baptized. And you don't need to be water baptized to, to, um, to have a part in the kingdom of God. What? What are you talking about, Alan? Which part of the kingdom of God do you want to be in? I do believe it's important. Somebody had asked me to share on this, and I actually completely forgot when we were in the last live show. I believe water baptism is very important, and there's a difference with it. And I believe that the difference is either going to the third heaven or going to paradise. That's how, that's how much I believe in it. Now, does it mean that somebody who's watching, praying, diligent, but didn't get water baptized, won't be part of the pre-trib? I don't believe so. I don't have the full answer for that. I don't believe so. But what I do believe is when they get there, they'll be in paradise, and they won't be in the third heaven. Now, paradise, the difference between, so in the kingdom of God, you have the third heaven, which is like the inner court, and paradise is the outer court. So all the mansions and everything, everybody's homes, I go and build a place, that's all there. The inner court is where the pre-trib group is going in the third heaven. The outer court is paradise, but it's also part of the kingdom of God. And that's how important I believe it is. And we can prove it. You know, we've shared on this, and we've got a video on the baptism as well. And anybody who uh, has questions, they could either put them in the comments um, or wants me to send them info. You can send me an email to theministryrevealed at gmail.com and I'll send you an email that I share with people. I believe that water baptism is important, that it's the difference between those two places. Listen to what it goes on to say in verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You see? I believe it's very, very important. This baptized is, is to be fully wet, is to be submerged in water. It is a water baptism. Why? Why water? People will argue and say, no, it's the Spirit. Yes, you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But if it wasn't important, why did Paul... And everybody he went to, when we read after the death and resurrection and after the 40 days and Christ is gone and after the, the Holy Ghost, why did we read about them baptizing? Wouldn't they have just laid the hands on, let people speak in tongues, have received the Holy Ghost and be gone? Why were they being baptized? Because you can't be buried with them if you never went under to come up. Hello. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's, it's going under the water and the old you dying 
and the new you coming up. Okay? Let me show it to you in John chapter 3. I'll show you the difference. Here it is right here. We talk about it in the video where we had a, um, a pastor on who came across our channel many years ago as we, in the earlier days. And when he saw these differences, he knew finally once and for all he could show with understanding what the differences were. And he travels and gives talks and everything on uh, baptism and the purpose and necessity. And what's the difference? Well, remember, in in Acts chapter 2, verse 35, I believe it is, it says that when they got baptized, it was what? In Jesus' name for the remission of sins. Why would they be doing it? Why would they be doing it after his death and resurrection and they were receiving the Holy Ghost? When they already got the Holy Ghost. See you later. All right? Don't worry about anybody being baptized in water. It's because there's purpose to it. It doesn't mean you have to. But if you want to be in the outer court instead of the inner court, all right? What did what did we just read in this one right here? All right? Then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise and others will possess the splendor of the city for everywhere the Savior will be seen. So you're going to see him in either place, but only according as you're worthy. That's a big deal. I would rather, <laughs> I'll speak for myself, but I believe it would apply to everybody. You'd rather the third heaven. All right? So, and, and when we read, so that's what we read in Acts chapter 2. To be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins to receive the free gift of the Holy Ghost. But when you go to Matthew chapter 28, it talks about being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you have churches all over the world baptizing one or the other. Some of them are lenient, which is very good to hear. There aren't many, though. Some of them are adamant that you could only be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, like Matthew 28. However, what they haven't realized is what I was telling you about, if you're new, that, that difference going on within the differences in the Gospels. Everybody's foundation comes from Matthew. So they go to Matthew and they say you have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, that's not for us. Now, if you've been baptized that way, and, and that's the way because you didn't know any difference, well, you were still baptized. I do believe that's okay. But if you've got time, and now that you, you're about to understand this or you've understood it, book in. Have, have a Christian friend. It doesn't have to be at a church. Have a Christian friend or a family member baptize you. And do it again and do it in Jesus' name. If you're doing it with the right heart and the right spirit, it, it won't hurt anything. All right? And so... When you understand these things, like these differences in the Gospels, you'll understand why there it is in Acts. It's like, it's like the beginning of the story for the church. It's the last 2,000 years. But Matthew 28 is to the millennial reign. That's why he says, and I'm with you always until the end of the world. Because that's when he returns feet down and he's with them until the end of the world at the end of the millennial reign. So listen to what it says here in John 3, <coughs> starting in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? So at the very least, you have to be born again. Then you'll see the kingdom of God. Well, let me show you what Mark says. <coughs> In Mark chapter 9, this is a picture of the end of seals and its typology. Okay? And it says, uh, some will not taste of death, right? This is to the end of the sixth seal, to the end of the sixth year of seals. Till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So they'll see it coming, but they don't go right away because it's about six, seven months or so before they get to go. That's why, you know, it's part of that day and hour and, and other things as well, which is the Lord coming. It has nothing to do with actual rapture. It's when he's seen coming at the end of the sixth year. And the great multitude rapture happens about somewhere around halfway through that seventh year of seals. But you see, have seen till they have seen the kingdom of God. So what did we see in, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in John 3? 
you have to uh, um, believe in Christ, right? So you have to have faith. You have to believe in Christ. And if you do that, you'll be able to see the kingdom of God. That kingdom of God and be able to see it coming is the one for paradise. Well, listen to what it says here. <coughs> Excuse me. In Luke 9, 27, the pre-trib group. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So one is see the kingdom of God. So the next thing, you're going to be alive. And those at the point of the pre-trib, when it happens, bang, they're gone. The next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. In Mark, they will have seen. Okay? It, it, they're going to see it later. So now when we go back to John chapter 3, listen to what it says. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 5 says, And Jesus answered, well, let's start. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Not, he's just a smart ass, right? <laughs> Jesus, of course, knowing it. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, end of spirit you see there's no comma it's not a comma and so it's not like there's a separation and together they're together except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter he cannot enter into the kingdom of god what is the enter the third heaven what's the outer court paradise you see born of water and of spirit so again, we go to Acts chapter 2, where is water and spirit? Verse 35, I think it is. 36. No, where is it? Is it? Yeah. Where am I? I'm not off that much. Where is it? Come on now. Have I lost my mind? Oh, verse 38. <coughs> Acts 2, 38. So Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what do you have? Baptized and Holy Ghost. They're not separate. They're part of the same deal. So you can repent and be born again in repentance, but you'll only get to see. You'll be in the outer court. If you're water and spirit in repentance and baptized of water and spirit, you can enter. Now, I don't know about you. I wouldn't take the chance. If you know it in advance, why chance it in advance? Right? It's one of those things. That you got to say, oh, now that I know, I should probably just go do it. But don't do it with that kind of heart, right? Do it with the heart of, yes, Lord, I heard, I understood, and I'll do it. If you don't believe it, it's not in your heart that you're fine, you're good to go, then don't worry about it, okay? You'll also see what Romans tells us about that. What Romans tells us about this, what's in your heart, all right? Uh, let's go Romans, back to Romans 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin were made by the law. So you see what's going on? <clears throat> Hardship, pain, affliction, suffering, all that. So before we were saved in Christ, being in the flesh. You see, remember what Romans 8, the next chapter ends up telling us? Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. We're not living in the flesh. We're not living by the flesh. You know, yes, we're still covered in these flesh suits, but we're not living by the flesh. So before we came to Christ and we were in the world, it was the flesh, you see? For when we were in the flesh, the motions, the hardship, the pains of sins, which were in the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So what was taking place when we were living in the world in flesh? The law. The law. 
So whether people know it or not, while they're living in the flesh, rejecting and not believing in Christ and going about their own things, their judgment and their fruit unto death is coming by the law of God. Of course, because as we were saying earlier, if there's no law, if there had been no law, then there was no way to persecute. Right? There was no way to, for the Lord to bring judgment on them for it. So they're living in the law and the Father's law or the Lord's law, whether they realize it or not. He's the judge. That's why the only thing we have to get out of it is Christ. Without Christ, we're under the law. With Christ, there is no more law, except that we love one another, even them. Hello. Verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit. See? That's why we're not under the law anymore. So if you over here telling you people you got to live under the law, da, 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 no. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, if you want to follow the law or if you want to be more, more righteous, uh, you know, don't eat pig. Even for myself, I was like that a while back. And <laughs> I have to admit, one of the reasons was because I live in Calgary. And as I was traveling several years ago, going this maybe 20, 25 years ago, and I was driving to Banff, I got stuck behind a, a trailer, a semi with pigs. And it was a mess. I almost threw up over myself like 10 times. I could not pass it. It was the worst ride of my life. It is singed. And from that point, I stopped eating pork for probably 10 years. But you're going to see what I'm talking about when I get to this. We're not under any of this law at all. You see, you guys will remember this. We've spoken about this before. Colossians 2.16. Right? Let no man therefore judge you in meat. So don't let anybody judge you in what you eat. Don't let anybody judge you in what you drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of Sabbath days. You see, because they're all what? They're all a shadow of things to come. There are people that are committed that uh, a Sabbath is this day. Oh, no, no, they, they made it a Sunday because they're twisting it around the whole world. So they go on another day. Then there's those who respect the, the 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th. Fantastic. There are those that will say the new moon is a full moon. Or is it the dark moon? Or is it the crescent of the moon? You see? Don't eat pork. Right? It's pig. Stay away from pig. Don't drink. You see? Doesn't mean you can do all these things with, with whatever will you feel and just be gorging on all these things no right eating and drinking in in uh in moderation right not getting drunk and getting hammered all the time but you're allowed to drink in moderation have a glass of, a glass of wine here and there and right if that's what you choose but i'll give you a great example and you're going to see this as we go further in romans in fact in the previous video the second one on romans I was hoping to get to it. Like I said, it ended up being three hours because I thought I was going to make it to the end of Romans. And what you're going to see is more of this conversation. That for me, I know drink isn't good for me. I know that I can get a little bit out of hand and I'll have definitely more than one glass of wine because I've always enjoyed it. But I haven't touched it now in, I think, almost eight years. I haven't had a single drop of alcohol in eight years. I have no desire. So does that mean for me, oh, maybe I can't? No. Do you know why it would be a sin for me? Hello. If you had a glass of wine and you have one with dinner, for example, is it a sin for you to have a glass of wine? Absolutely not. Would it be a sin for me to have a glass of wine? 100%. And do you know why? Because within me, I know that I should not for the Lord. For me, because of how I am. So 
somebody has a Sabbath and they want to do it like the Jews and they want to observe it on Friday into Saturday. That's the Sabbath day. A lot of people like to harp on it on other people. This tells you right here not to harp on other people for it. Don't let anybody judge you on it. But somebody might want to do it on a Friday, Saturday, and maybe I do it on a Sunday, just as an example. So does that mean, oh, uh, I'm not going to do it on Sunday because I'm with you. Okay, I'm going to do it on your Friday. But if I'm committed to me doing it on a Sunday, I'll, I'll have respect if I'm with my friend and he does it on a Friday. But if I do it on a Sunday, it doesn't mean that, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do it on Sunday. Would that be a sin for me? Yep. Pretty wild, right? This isn't just me saying it. I'm going to prove it to you. That's what it says in Romans. It's not a sin to everybody. But for you inside, if it's not for you and not what you do and what you believe. And you do it anyways. Well, then it's a sin for you. Hello. You're going to see it. Uh, where am I? Romans. Back to Romans. Was it seven? Or did we did seven? Is that where it just was? Yeah. Uh, da, 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 okay. Romans seven. Motion of sins. Never bring forth unto death. Yeah. So all of that is tied into the same type of thing, right? Although this was the extreme. You know that that when you were in the flesh, you had no idea and you were under the law of God. Now, in Christ, we have no more law, okay? Except to love. Except to love. And in that love, we fulfill all these things of the law. We are generous. We're teachers. We're pastors. We're, we share with friends. We, we gather together in love. We eat, we... You see? And we're to do these things in love. But there's no more law on us. You see? It's, it's, it's so cool to understand. It just, it all starts to make so much more sense. See, here's that part I was talking about now in relation to those who are in Christ spirit-filled. So in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So those who are spirit filled in Christ are no longer under the law like those who are living in the flesh. That's why they're going to be judged by the law at the end. You See, no condemnation to the rest because we're not under the law. And there's a lot here in Romans 8. We're definitely not going to go in through all of it. Again, we're just going to highlight some some key points. So, uh, da, 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 none. yeah, even eight eleven. No, let's go a little bit further. One of my favorite parts. Okay, Romans eight fourteen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, remember Genesis one verse two, the Spirit of God was over the waters. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All right? Sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. That's the Father comma and joint heirs with christ this is what i was talking about uh, uh, earlier if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together now of course there's the is of this and there's the suffering that christians suffer and are persecuted all over the world and different types of sufferings that that ridicule and so forth from non-believers and family and so forth around the world. And there's the is application of this as well. But we know the is to come application of this has to do with those who are apportioned joint heirs with Christ who will suffer with them. It's that remnant bride portion so that they may be what? Glorified together. This word used one time, remember we shared on that, dignity? It's connected to those in Revelation chapter 20 
who are resurrected from the dead, who will rule and reign with Christ for the thousand years. That's the is to come of it, right? Some great stuff in here in Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Remember this manifestation? That word lighten? Let me show it to you. We're going to be covering it in a, once we get to another section. But here it is right here. Where did we see it? In Luke chapter 2, verse 32. What is Luke chapter 2, 32? It's the period reflecting the end and the typology of the is to come. It's a picture of the end of the 40 days of the Son of Man and that remnant worker bride portion who have now received understanding and his light to go shed the light to the Gentiles during the time of seals. It's only there in every gospel. You see, again, for anybody that's new, when you find things like this and going into the Septuagint and digging into these word definitions, it blows your mind. Because when you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you'll see that when things like this appear, where it's only in Luke or it's in Mark in Matthew, or it's only in Matthew, you will have a greater insight into the period of time it's talking about in the is to come. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Wait until you see it down here as well. Look at that. 1 Peter 1, 7 and 13. We've talked about 1 Peter 1. We'll talk about it when we get to the end of this because it applies to another section as well where you're going to see, as we've taught in 1 Peter 1, it's a conversation to the remnant worker bride. Exactly as the ones here who have been given the light. It's beautiful. So what are they waiting for? So the creature who is Mark's group, because this word creature, for those that don't know, only appears in Mark. <laughs> Why? Because they're the portion of light that was corrupted that Romans 1 was talking about, which is the Gentile portion that the Lord came to save to bring to his glorious light. The first group is spirit filled. Then they're going to be the workers are going to be given the light to go out and shine that light spirit filled on the rest to bring in the fullness of the of the Gentiles. OK, but what are they what are they waiting for unknowingly to them? They're waiting they, they, for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of who? The sons of God. They're waiting for what? They're waiting for the pre-trip to happen and the manifestation of the remnant workers to go and wake them up and save them. Because they're, they're stuck. They're in bondage to corruption. You see, there's your travailing in pain that we covered. It talked about um, just like the 40 days, that, that travailing is the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man. It's awesome, awesome stuff. We, we came down here. Where was it? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, let's go uh, Romans 8, 35 and 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, this is that remnant worker. Shall tribulation? Well, you see, it can't be Luke's group. Sure, there's the is of these things, but in the is to come prophetic understanding of it, there is no tribulation to the pre-trib bride of Christ going to the third heaven. So it's talking to his remnant bride, his vessels. Hello. You know where we're going with that. His vessels. Okay. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword? You see, nothing will for these guys. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Hello. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. This was an awesome catch too, right? Vanquish beyond that is gained of de a decisive victory. It's so powerful, it's only used one time. 
but to show us the the direct implication of all of this peace that it's talking about which is the time of the manifestation of the sons of god that remnant worker group who will suffer as he suffered who will be his servant bride will be conquerors and what's the portion of time go to the root word of it and what is it it's the word from revelation chapter 6 the white horse rider when the son of man the white horse rider is conquering into conquer he's doing it with the four, with the the remnant worker bride during the 40 days now they're prepared and they're going to go out and conquer hello the picture is everywhere All right, what else? Oh, chapter 9, of course. It has many, many things. This was huge, right? This is uh, what I touched on briefly in relation to the be accounted. And when we went to the be accounted, right, we, we got there when we were looking here at Romans 9, 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for seed. A remnant that are kept for seed for planting and we shared how the only way that that a great multitude of the gentiles the fullness of the gentiles will come in is if that wheat seed is crushed as a cover crop that will flourish to help bring in more nutrients to help bring in a greater wheat harvest which is the spring wheat of the great multitude rapture, whereas the pre-trib was the winter wheat. We've got great videos on that. It's the difference between the old before the new, a picture of Leah before Rachel. Okay? And which you're going to see here as well, lo and behold, right? So where did this seed lead us? We saw that it led us to what we were showing earlier with Romans in relation to the be accounted which we saw right here. So in Psalms 22, verse 30 and 31, it lined up with our chapters to years. Here it is right here, Psalms 22. And where is it? In the fourth year of seals, right where all this persecution will be happening. And what does it say? A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people. Who do you think they are? Especially when this chapters to years of all these books has fallen right here in the midst of seals when the persecution is going crazy. Awesomeness. Just awesome stuff. Back to nine. So that was the seed and then we see here, so this is this is talking about uh, um, Jacob and Esau, but the picture is also of one like Leah and Rachel, and it says here in Romans nine twelve, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Who's the elder? Winter wheat is called old wheat. It's going to be the cover crop to serve the younger, which is spring wheat and the great multitude rapture at the fullness of the Gentiles. So who is the elder in relation to not a, a, a Jacob Esau story here, but in the typology of winter wheat and spring wheat of Leah to Rachel? It's the picture of the Leah bride, the winter wheat bride, that remnant who will remain to serve the younger. Okay. In bondage of service to the younger, they're the ones putting their necks on the line. It's all about in the prophetic is to come. It is all about those putting their necks on the line. Those being the cover crop, because in their death, as we saw in uh, it was it John three, where it says that a seed dies or John four where the seed dies 
and it produces more crop? That's exactly what this is telling us. The same story. So good. All right, now I got to bring this one up again. Um, you know, and the reason I'm doing this and going through these things and hitting on these key parts is because one, repetition gives greater understanding, and two, because it's the last one. So now we're just going to tie it all together and then bring it into the detail of the final ones by hitting on these key points. And Romans 9.23 is a big one. It was so awesome. And, it, and I was so foolish because I couldn't believe that I, I knew there was something that I was seeing. I'm like, what the heck was it? And then it wasn't until I moved on and then bang, it dawned on me when I saw one of my, one of my tabs that I had. And so I went back and made it known. But I really want to now make it known again <clears throat> so that it's clearly understood. Because it's this verse is gangbusters to the story of what we're saying. A remnant chosen, a, a, a group who he has made known, who are his remnant bride, who are the older to serve the younger, who are like the cover crop of winter wheat so that the spring wheat can be more plentiful. That's what this is all about. And it says in 923 of Romans, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore. See, there they are again. Those that he had predestined, those that he had afore prepared unto glory. This is what I was talking about early in the beginning of the video when I was saying that if it wasn't going, if it wasn't for going through Romans and, and starting to see this, this prophetic understanding in the is to come laid under the is, if we hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have been able to get to the end of it. One chapter we've shared a lot on, I wouldn't have seen this. It wouldn't have clued into me or dawned on me had we not done this study and it's this powerful one right here and that he might make known right to give understanding well what is that it's this one right here luke 2 15 why again is this so important well for new people when you understand that when Luke in chapter 1 says, I understood all things from the beginning in order. That's a powerful statement. I understood all things from the beginning in order, and I'm here to tell you. Like, that is bold. That is in itself a prophetic revelation. And what it is, we've got a video or a few videos on it, that is what we call Luke in order. Luke chapter 1 is a picture of the pre-trib bride of Christ taken. And then there's the to the eighth day circumcision of John, which is a picture of the Lord then coming at the eighth day, Luke chapter 2, to begin his 40 days as a picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Then he's gone. He returns at the end of the sixth year of seals. And that's John chapter uh, uh, Luke chapter 3. It's a picture of him at the end of seals coming and you see John was there and there a brood of vipers and who told you to escape the wrath. You see, that's the wrath of Revelation chapter six when the wrath of the lamb is coming. And then in the prophetic picture of Luke in order, Luke chapter four, the son of man comes. It's a picture of the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of the 13 years of tribulation. And it leaves only the 14th. And what do we see? It's the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. But what do we see? We see Satan's there and Satan tempts him. Well, it just so happens for the last two and a half years of trumpets or from mid trumpets, about ten and a half years into tribulation, two and a half years of the final three and a half are Satan. The pit opened the Antichrist coming back. And the false prophet coming back from his hiding, coming back onto the scene. All three of them will be there, which is how you get Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 that I was telling you about earlier. So what do we see? The Lord now returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And who's there? Satan there to tempt him. And it's a picture to the end of it. 
And then Jesus proclaims that uh, it, it's now heard, like Isaiah, it's now heard in their, in their ears. And what is he doing? He's declaring the final jubilee. He's declaring the jubilee that's now coming. So when his final year, he's, he's tempted by Satan, he's going to finally destroy him. He's going to be bound for a thousand years, destroys all that came against Jerusalem. That final year is over, and it's the declaration of jubilee, which is the final 15th year of the four, after the 14th. That is Luke in order. So why is it that Luke chapter 2, verse 15, <clears throat> is important that this term, made known, is here? Remember what I said earlier? It's not in any other of the synoptic gospels. The only place it could be in Luke outside of the discourses is in Luke chapter 2 if it was trying to portray to us a prophetic end time picture of when he's talking to his remnant worker bride that when he returns from the wedding and comes on the eighth day to begin his 40 days with his remnant bride, Luke 2 is where it should be. It's so good, in fact, where you find it, that you have the picture of it being the shepherds when they first hear of his birth. And why does that matter? Because that's exactly who we are. That's exactly who those who are the remnant worker brides will be. Which verse was that in? 15. Okay? So Luke 2, 15, listen to what it says. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing that is, which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. The same made known. We did a video on this a few months ago showing that these shepherds in the field and these angels coming to visit them is a picture of this, this warning, the, these remnant workers that will be left behind being probably, you see, in this case, it was just something quote-unquote simple in that they were told, even though it was glorious, by the heavenly host coming to tell them. However, in the is to come, Whoever these people are, wherever they're spread around the world that are the remnant bride workers, which I believe is a number of us potentially, I believe they're going to be translated to Jerusalem because that's where the Lord will first come. And that's what's, that's what's being shared right here, right at the beginning of his 40 days. So how fitting that that word in Romans is right there. And you'll see as we get further uh, into the other parts of Romans why it's important at the end as well. So here it is right here. And that he might make known to his remnant workers, his bride remaining, that lay a type Gentile picture of the older before the younger, the riches of his glory on the vessels of his mercy. A lot of people like this one. Look at the word for vessels. Specifically, a wife as contributing to the usefulness of the husband. Enough said. How much more? How much more with the wheat, with the Leah and Rachel, with the older before the younger, with understanding the harvest of the winter compared to the spring, the old before the new? It's awesome. It's so awesome. That he had a foreknown, right? That he had a foreprepared in advance unto glory and clearly this is a bride portion and then children that follow so we've talked about this and i've said it again and i'm going to say it again that we know there is an is of this that there's an is which is a picture of pre-trib in a group remaining but it is also a picture of the remaining Gentile bride worker remaining now for the children of the Gentiles. Okay? So now listen to what it says. Even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Osi, which is of course Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not my beloved. You see? 
How much more clear does that have to be in relation to specifically a wife contributing to the usefulness of her husband? This is his Gentile bride. And her usefulness is going to be what? To the people that were not his people. The Gentiles. So awesome, right? So awesome. This was great too. Romans 9.29 And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed. Remember what the seed was? A group of people remaining to fall to the ground to produce more fruit. If that seed wasn't left, we would have been a Sodom and been made like Gomorrah. Right? They would have been toast. If there was nobody left, if the Lord doesn't have this remnant worker group for the portion of seals to help bring in the great multitude, to help save them and bring them to Christ, they would have been toast. There would have been nobody to save them. The spirit would have been gone and there would have been no light to shed. It would have been gone too. This is such a powerful, powerful verse. All right. Let's continue on. 10, was there much in 10? Zeal according to the knowledge. Yeah, we talked about this, you know, by hearing. They don't really hear. All right. Verse 11, uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11, again, it's one of those that has a lot. Uh, this is where we ended last time, right? In the second one. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Uh, this is a great one. Again, the, in a lot of the things when I do the opening, of course, it's to set you up for things that I know I'm going to be touching on later. And this is another one of those great examples. Just like... Ecclesiastes. This one is so perfect for showing the Ecclesiastes 1 9. The thing that was and the thing that is, both of them are a picture of the is to come. And what do we see in Romans 11 4? But what say it the answer of God? Uh, let's go one back. Uh, in verse 3, Romans 11 3. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone. And they seek my life. We covered what this conversation was a picture of in the is to come. And he says in verse four, but what say at the answer of God unto him? I have reserved. OK, I have left a group down. I have left behind. I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Well, it turns out. When we went to the Old Testament. Is it for, yeah, uh, no, First Kings. First Kings chapter 20, we see this picture right here, which when we go into this story, we know in First Kings chapter 20, it is a picture of the end of the 13 years of tribulation, the end of the sixth year of trumpets to the beginning of the seventh year of trumpets. And this time, when Syria comes at the end of the year, they're going to be destroyed. They come with the larger army. And this time Israel will have the smaller one, but the Lord will prevail for them. And they're going to be victorious. And it will be that final battle, that final great sword in the 14th year when the Lord is here. We know that when the 14 years begins, when the 50 days are over, it's connected to First Chronicles. No. Yes, no. Why am I mixed up now? First, Second Chronicles. Oh, why am I confused? 24. Yeah. So in Second Chronicles 24, we see the opposite story. <coughs> we see the story where the, it's the end of the year and Syria comes up against Judah and Jerusalem and destroys them, even though Syria was a smaller army and Jerusalem was bigger. But in their pomp and their pride, having forsaken the Lord God of their fathers, Syria is coming to destroy them. This is how the 14 years begins at the end of the 50 days 
in the year that the tribulation will begin, which I believe is next year based on the Jubilee count from Christ, uh, biblically proven, based on the 13 to the 14 years, based on the Shemitah year cycles, all of it. This would happen next year at the time of the Feast of Trumpets, right after the 50 days are finished. Whereas the one in 1 Kings chapter 20 is now Syria coming with pride and with a larger army and Israel with less, okay? Here's that 7,000 like Ecclesiastes 1.9 in the was. And what happened? They were victorious. They were victorious and, de and destroyed the, great, the larger multitude that came against them. It's the 14th year of tribulation. When we go to Romans, we saw just there that in the is, he had reserved, even in this time, 7,000. Well, now we're looking at Romans in the is to come, which is the is showing the is to come. We were able to show 1 Kings 20 in the was as a picture of the is to come. And then, lo and behold, both of them point to the exact same time, which is the end of the 13th year of tribulation, the end of the sixth year of trumpets. And what happens when we go to the end of the sixth trumpet? Verse 13, Revelation 11, verse 13. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the quake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant, you see? And there was a remnant, right? Remember there was, I, I would have a small remnant at the very end, even though there as the sand of the sea, only a remnant would remain. That's them. Who helped bring them in? Well, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. Which 7,000? The 7,000 he had reserved. They died, the remnants afraid and gives glory to the God of heaven. When is it? The end of the sixth trumpet. That's the end of the sixth year of trumpets or the 13th year of tribulation. You see, <laughs> the, you understand, as, you, as you're around longer, you'll understand why we just get so excited about these things. Because it all goes back to who the Gospels are speaking to. And when you understand it, man, it's, it's just over the top to be able to see it and understand it. So the question kind of is, who are those 7,000? Well, it kind of appears that they're a part of this Remnant bride, does it not? They didn't bow down the knee to the image of Baal, which was during seals. They're being spoken about as reserved 7,000 in Romans, which is a conversation of those while he's here for 40 days and who will work during seals, which would mean there's got to be this portion. There, there is no bowing down to the image of Baal which is the image of the Antichrist during seals. That doesn't happen during trumpets. Oh, sure, Satan will be there, Antichrist will be brought back, and, I mean, it's going to be mass chaos and free-for-all. I mean, we saw that Zechariah 11, which is the 11th year of tribulation, when this happens and the pit is open, that they're going to be eating each other's arms and stuff. <laughs> the end of days is going to be crazy, guys. Anybody thinks who, that it's happened already on a global scale to all parts of the earth? You're just not paying attention. You haven't understood the scriptures, right? It's craziness. So it does appear that they might be that final 7,000 reserved for the end who were part of this pre-trib remnant worker bride who will what? Serve, right? Be the ones to the usefulness of her husband? It appears as though of course, we saw uh, what then Israel hath not obtained, that which it seeketh, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Well, thank goodness for us that they were blinded, right? It goes on to talk about it some more. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. 
It's like there's all this punishment happening for them. And David said, let it be a, a snare and a trap to them. Let it be a stumbling block and a recompense. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their, ba- uh, their back always. You see, it, 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 it seems like, man, this is brutal. Why? Well, it's because of their disobedience. This is for the disobedience of Judah. But it's for our benefit, and the Lord uses it to make them jealous. You see, we see this, this exact thing being told to us in Isaiah chapter 6. That if this never happened, we'd be in trouble. Verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go forth? So it's a picture, a typology of Christ, right? Then said I, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest or unless they end up seeing and hearing. And understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So if they weren't blinded, we'd be the ones that were finished. There would have been nothing for us. Because if they came all in, then there would be no time of the Gentiles. It would have ended. Thank goodness they were purposely blinded. It's it's a hard thing to 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 understand i mean i mean it's easy to see and to read it and to understand but to comprehend it within ourselves that isn't isn't the whole purpose is for them to see for them to hear for them to understand and to convert and be healed i mean isn't that the purpose for everybody of course it is but in order hello Listen to when it said, when it will be over, and then their portion will come. Then said I, how long? Uh, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Yikes. Okay. Okay. So were there prophetic times of times when it happened? Sure. Right? Because this is the was. So there was an is typology of Christ, but there was clearly an is to come. Why? Because they're still blinded. They still can't hear. They still don't have the understanding. Again, that's why it brings us to Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that was shall be. The thing that is shall be. Thank goodness for that. Okay, there he is. But rather that through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So when we go to Zechariah and you go to chapter 8 and you understand in the chapters to years, Zechariah chapter 8 is a picture of the beginning of trumpets. We see the Lord is here on Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord over Jerusalem. And what does he say? Let your hands be strong. The foundation was laid, and now it's time to build the temple of the Lord. They couldn't do it before, because before these days was the seven years of seals. So they couldn't rebuild the city and the streets and everything, because he set everybody against his neighbor. It was the time of affliction or tribulation. That's the red horse rider. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and it'll begin at Jerusalem. The only thing that'll be done during seals is the foundation will get laid. That's it. <coughs> so we see that, as I was telling before, when people only see seven years of trumpets, I mean seven years of tribulation, and they don't understand that it applies to seven years of trumpets and not seven years as seals and trumpets, the world of seven years tri- uh, tribulation will tell you that until you see the temple being built, don't worry about it. Because... Because the Antichrist has to step into the temple and declare himself God. Eh. That's mid-trumpets. The seals portion is the temple of God, which is the portable, 
covered in skins temple of Moses, which for us is our flesh. So this is the beginning of trumpets. But what did it just say in Romans? That the Lord would use the Gentiles to make them jealous. Well, look what happens when the Lord is no longer jealous or using us to make them jealous. Zechariah 8, 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with a great fury. So he's no longer jealous. He's no longer making them jealous, which is why he is no longer jealous in it. Why? Because the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. They will no longer need this blinding. You see? There's no need to provoke them to jealousy anymore or for him to be jealous for them because just like we see at the end of the sixth seal, the Lord is coming and that's when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. <clears throat> okay, how much more their fullness, them receiving life from the dead. Okay, a lot of these things, I'm, again, we've covered many of these things over again. I just want to hit on some of the points, like I said. Now we go into chapter 12. Okay. Um, Romans chapter 12. How much did I want to go in here soberly? According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay, let's start there. In verse 3, Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let prophecy, let prophesy according to the portion of faith. So there is prophecy now, right? Or prophets prophesying or people that give prophetic words. The only problem is you must be able to discern them. And that's the hardest part, right? Uh, verse seven or ministry. Let us wait on ministering. Right. That reminds me of like our, our brother Steve over in Uganda, him and his team ministering, going out throughout Uganda and some of the surrounding areas and ministering three times a month, be doing big weekend events. We help support that. We pay for the Bibles. We we pay for the travels. Not me. All of us here make that possible. There are those who pray over them in their portion, you see, in their portion of their faith in prayer, in intercession. And what are we doing? Lifting them up. And what is he doing? He is doing his portion in what they've been blessed in ministering. What's mine? Or he that teacheth, teaches, uh, or he that teacheth on teaching. You see, I don't get up here and say, thus saith the Lord. I'm, I know I'm a teacher. Would I love to receive a prophetic revelation like like actual thus saith the Lord? Of course I would. Prayerfully, one day it will happen. But this is what I have been blessed with in the revelation of the prophecy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The revelation of the end of days understood as it's never been understood before. Does everybody have that ability? No, but that's OK. Can you have some of it? Of course you can. Can you learn and grow in it? Of course you can. Each have different parts to different extents. How about this in verse 8? Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. How about this one? This is one that we would love to have applied more often, right? Every ministry would because we can always use it to reach more like those ministering in Uganda. Or help the teachings to be able to get more done to reach more. What is it? He that giveth 
let him do it with simplicity. Interesting wording, isn't it? So not he that, that giveth, let him give. But he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. So, you know, sometimes I, I know years ago I would hum and haw whether I well, maybe I should give and then something comes up and then I'm like, eh. you see what I'm saying? But for those that just do it, right? It's not a concern. They do it. They understand what's happening. And so they support the ministry by doing it. You see, everybody has their portion. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. We can all have parts in many of these different things at different portions and different times throughout the year, throughout our lives. Some might even get a prophetic word truly at some point as well. So everybody could be playing their part. And so, again, what is this all coming down to? Romans is all about what? In the whole package, in the is and the is to come, it's all about love. It's all about a heart thing, not a knowing thing. You see, does that mean, oh, Alan, all these teachings are about understanding, and it's not an understanding thing, it's a heart thing. It's a heart thing in understanding. Do you get it? If we weren't to understand the prophecy of the is to come, he wouldn't have given it in his word. He wouldn't have told us in Revelation 19 that the spirit of the Lord is prophecy. Hello. There'd be no need to learn it. It would have been a real short book of the New Testament. You see? But it's from where it comes from. If it's the heart, if it's with joy and gladness and sharing it in love to all those he brings to hear it and to receive it. Hello. You see, we don't do this out of spite or out of grandeur or out of any of that. I do it out of the joy and love of the Lord and wanting to help others draw closer and understand them better. Because if it makes me this exciting, this excited, I know it makes others just as excited because people have been confused about this for centuries because it wasn't yet the time. Well, now it is. And the time is almost up. <clears throat> How about this one? Um, and, and this kind of goes all the way throughout, right? You know, because it's all about love. Let's go to Romans 12, 17. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> you see, do you think the Lord knows the plight of men? Do you think the Lord understands us? If it be possible, as much as you have it in you, Live peaceable with all men. Okay? He knows you're not going to be perfect. He knows you're not going to be able to always do it. But as much as you can within you, live peaceable with everybody. Turn a cheek and just walk away. You see? 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Okay? Don't give in to wrath. Give place to wrath. Put it aside. F listen to this. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Hello. There is no greater vengeance that you'll get on anybody than what the Lord will bring them. And in doing the better thing in love, look at what verse 20 says. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt hope heap coals of fire on his head. <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? Don't repay them. Vengeance is mine. But in doing something truly loving for them instead, that will burn like coals on them because of what you've done. You see? 
but you're not doing it from the vengeance way. You're submitting yourself in love to the Lord and saying, all right, that person needs my help. We can do that. <laughs> it's awesome. Let's see, did we have 13? Let me, let me check on here what I had for 13. Because I probably had a specific place. Oh, yes. Romans 13. Verse 8. Oh, no man, anything uh, be fulfilled in the law. Everything is fulfilled in love. I think it was 13. All right. Uh, verse 10. Romans 13, verse 10. Love worketh. Now, this is the part. So what we're getting into in these portions here is a lot of stuff that we can be doing in the is. All right. It's a lot of things that we're doing in the is, even though these are things that are applicable as we've been doing in the is to come. But a lot of this in this section is definitely an is, but most certainly in a time of the is to come as well. So this is a, a section that you can really look at this in, in both contexts clearly now and is to come. Um, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. See, period. There it is. And that knowing the time that now is high time to awake. See that? Knowing that the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we believed. See, the day is closer at hand every single moment of our lives than when we first came to believe. Stay awake. No time for sleeping, right? And that is figurative, of course. Get your sleep, <laughs> but spend your time daily in the Lord as well. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, there let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So again, Christ came to save those who were asleep, to be the light portion to that Mark group in the is. And here he is, this group in this time of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let's show a great example of that right here in John chapter 8. For those who want to see it in the chapters to years, there it is. It's the beginning of the 14 years. What was Hosea 1? Where he said in uh, Romans uh, 8 or 9, and he says, Hosea, right, in Osi, the ones that weren't my people shall now be my people, and her beloved will be now my beloved. That wasn't my beloved shall be my beloved. It's right there in Hosea chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Where is this in John? Same thing, right at that time of the start of the 14 years. And what do we see? We see the woman caught in adultery, which means an adultery. It's a picture, as I've shared many times, a picture of the Gentile bride. It means like a dog is a Gentile, uh, uh, an adulteress, right, is a Gentile, just like we've shared with Ruth in chapter two or three. Why have you taken to me and why are you so doing this to me? Um, seeing that I'm a stranger and the word stranger also means adulteress. Okay, it's it's another term for Gentile. This is a picture of his Gentile bride before him. And they want a stoner and Jesus is the only one. Only he who is without sin can cast the first stone. This is what we were talking about earlier. This is that Revelation 12 one sign. This is the meteor coming. This is the stone's throw from Luke chapter 22. I believe it was. Yeah, Luke chapter 22, when he went up to pray and he said he's a stone's toss away. He's a stone's throw away. That's only found in Luke. And then everybody leaves. All right, I saw an interesting video, actually, somebody shared the other day. And I think others have seen this and understood this before. That when Jesus bent down and was writing on the ground, people, were, people have often wondered what was it that he was writing. Well, the, other, the entire context from the end of Luke 7 into uh, sorry john 7 into john 8 the entire context is from another piece of scripture and what it was was the writing of names as it took place in the past they would write 
uh, I don't know if it was somewhere on the ground in the Sanhedrin or, or whatever it was in the temple. And what you find out, it was an exact picture of what was taking place. And that's why they walked away from the eldest to the youngest, because Jesus was writing their names in the sand. Okay? So that was the context of what was taking place here. And so we see that only the woman is left standing in the midst. So while Jesus is bent over writing, they all start walking away. They're all gone. Jesus looks up like a guy on bended knee, and there's his bride standing in his midst. Okay, that's the picture we get. Again, this is almost like that what? That, that remnant bride. It's that remnant bride portion who's left. And listen to what it says next in context of what we were just talking about in Romans 13. Here's the bride, go and sin no more. So there's his remnant bride to serve and work with him. And she's going to be what? Well, she's part of the spirit and she's going to be given the light to go and share with the world. And here we see right after he's there with her in John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, who's the one about to receive this light? Who are the ones going to receive the light during the 40 days with the Son of Man and then are going to go share it with the world to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles? You got it. His remnant bride. His remnant worker bride is going to be the one receiving that light to get those out of the darkness. Exactly the same context again that we're seeing here in Romans 8, verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off darkness, uh, 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 cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Romans 8, right there. Okay? Even says, look, the time is far spent. Time to wake up from your sleep. Who are the ones sleeping? The Gentile church, the sleeping church, right? All is and is to come. <clears throat> All right, this is another good one. Uh, Romans 14. Uh, yeah, Romans 14 from verse 17. Listen to this. Again, an is and an is to come, okay? This ties into what we were talking about earlier that I said when we got later in Romans, you'd be able to see it. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. Okay? In fact, when you go back, you see that as well. It talks about, you know, it, it's not about what you eat and it's not about what you drink. It's not about these types of things, all right? Oh, right here. Okay, let's start in Romans 14, 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Money is not unclean. Pigs for food <clears throat> it's not unclean. Having a drink of alcohol, wine, whatever, it's not unclean. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. That's what I was talking about earlier. You see? If I were to have a glass of wine with you and you have one every day with your dinner, Beautiful. I would love to enjoy that, but I can't. It's just not me anymore. I made a commitment, a promise to the Lord and to myself. My next glass of wine will be with the Lord in his presence. But for you to have it, you're not in your you're not in your conscience saying, oh, man, I, I shouldn't have this wine. I, I feel guilty. You know, maybe I shouldn't do it. If that's the way you're having a glass of wine, you're sinning. You following? If you're smoking and you're, you're feeling guilt-ridden for smoking, you're sinning. That's what it says. All right? 
But if you're not, and you're doing it, and you're you're enjoying it, you're not doing it in a sinful way, you're not obsessed, you're not, you know what I mean? Well, if it's not in you, and you're not feeling unclean and doing it, then the Lord says you're not sinning. You'll see. Verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat. <clears throat> so here's an example. If you go to a friend's house and you're bringing over a, 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 a pork loin. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe you're going to a Jewish friend, right? Well, uh, man, what are you doing eating that, right? Watch. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat. Now walkest thou not charitably. See, so if you knew that they didn't like to eat that or if you knew that I didn't drink and you're coming to my house and you're bringing a bottle of wine. Well, now you're not walking very charitably because, you know, for me, that's not the thing to do. You see what I'm saying? So then it says, destroy not him with your meat for whom Christ died. OK, so I'm going to your place. I'm Canadian. I love my Canadian bacon. I'm coming for a visit. And you want to abide by not eating pork. And for you, it's a conviction. And I bring pork and you're like, oh, OK, OK. But I knew you didn't like pork, but I'm like, hey, I like it. So I'll cook it. No worries. Well, now I'm, I'm putting you in that awkward position that for you is uncomfortable. That's the type of thing this is also talking about. You see, I'll eat it without feeling sin because it's not unclean to me, but for my brother it is. So don't bring it. Just have it another time. Because to one it's a sin and to other it's not. And that's how the Lord will judge it. That's what he tells us. Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not food or drink. It is not meat or drink. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You see, is it does does any of this have to do with food or what you eat, like what you eat or what you drink? No, but to, to, the, to the person who it doesn't do those things. And then he kind of feels he has to and then he feels guilt to him. It's because he sinned. Yet nothing with the kingdom of God is going to keep you out because of what you eat or what you drink. But don't go making your brother or sister sin in doing these things around them or with them, knowing that they don't do it. Or saying, oh, just come on, have one. That's the type of thing it's talking about. For he, uh, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us, therefore, follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. You see that? Here's a great example, a quick one. Um, I go out to drink, and if let's say I was drinking, okay? Or no, because I don't, I'll use one of you guys. One of you guys goes out to drink, and other people in Christ know who you are, and they see you out in public and you're just having a glass of wine with meal or you're having a beer with your dinner at some restaurant and you're seen. And then people see you and somebody says, oh, hey, so and so. And they 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 were having dinner and they saw you have another drink. You see. So this is what's happening. So it, it might get people to 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 go back and forth and to go and talk to somebody. Hey, you know, uh. I didn't think he drank very much, but I, I saw him have a couple drinks at dinner. And then people start to speak like that, you see? Even though there should be no judgment in it, because for you, it's not judgment. You're just enjoying a couple glasses of wine or a glass of wine at dinner. But for somebody else, that's how you do it. <clears throat> you see? All this craziness breaks out. Listen to verse 20 now. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eats with offense. So whoever eats that piece of bacon and, and really didn't want to or or has it with his friend who doesn't eat bacon 
or has the glass of wine and the other one isn't really having a glass of wine and you're visiting. It's bringing offense to the other one. And if the other one feels he's going to have a little bit and then feels guilt, he's just sinned and you've caused him to sin. Pretty wild, right? It doesn't mean they're, they're sin unto death. It doesn't mean uh, uh, it's unredeemable sin. It just means that you've caused them to, slip, to sin. All right? They've allowed themselves to go into it, and to them it was sin even though to you it wasn't. But you see, to God, it's not, it's not food or drink. Right? It's not food or drink that's the kingdom of God. It, it, it's not a big deal except to the person doing it when they know within themselves they didn't want to. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hello. That's exactly what I was just saying. Just do it in your own time. Do it when you're out and about doing, you know, something else, but not around the ones that'll it'll stumble. Has thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is what it's saying. So it is very much and is. This is what I was talking about. This is very much and is application, but it will apply to the is to come as well. Okay? So really, a, a really good is application right now. If you feel guilt over it, because you, it's something you don't want to, and you feel that it offends the Lord, whether it's food or drink, you see, if it's offending you, if, if, it's, if it's in you like that, then don't have it, because if you have it, you're sinning. But if it doesn't, and you, you enjoy your bacon and eggs, and you've just enjoyed it and gave thanks to the Lord for your meal, well, then it's not a sin for you. Okay? So hopefully that's now clear. I just thought that was a really good one to get into. You know, bring some clarity to something that seems simple, but I think a lot of us have missed over the years. Okay, 15, 15. Let's go see 15. Where did I have it? I had it at 5. All right. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse... I know I had it like that. Well, let's start in verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Amen. Verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and loud them, all ye people. Ready for this? Check it out. Verse 12. And again Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, comma, and he shall raise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Okay? There shall be a root of Jesse, comma, and he that shall rise. This is not... One person. 
It never was. How many times have we showed what comma and means? Comma and is an addition. The comma separates the two and the and adds them together. Two plus two. The two is its own two. The two is his own two. Add them together and they make four. So they are together, but they are two twos. You follow? There's a two here. There's a two here. And they're together. Okay? That's what it is. Or I guess it would have been easier to do one. <laughs> there's a one here and there's a one here. They're each a one. And together they make two. But they're still both ones. That's what's going on here. One is a root of Jesse, comma, and the other is he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, who is this? Well, we've proven this before. It's really clear when you understand the differences in the Gospels and you have open books of the prophets. Here's the ones that are counted as the two witnesses. What do we see? Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11. What is this a picture of? This is the end of the sixth seal time frame. This is right towards the end of the first six years of seals. And what do we see? It's the picture of Joshua, like the typology of the one who takes them over into the promised land because Moses, as a type of John the Baptist, has died. The, the worker, Gentile worker, remnant bride have been dying, right? The John types. And then you've got the Elijah types who are the ones who make it alive. Although we'll probably be the ones at the end. <laughs> go, go see our sister Petra for that one, for that, that portion at the end. However, now, so knowing this, we know that the two witnesses are coming at the end of seals, right? So here's that picture of them coming onto the scene. And who do we see? Zechariah 6, verse, starting in verse 11. Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Yeshua, I mean Joshua, who is Yeshua in the typology, the son of Jodek, who is who? The high priest. So we've taught on this many times, right? This is Joshua, Yeshua typology, the high priest, King Melchizedek. Okay, the high priest, King Melchizedek, has the greater authority who is the one directly connected to the father than is the one who the branch is. You see, the branch is what? The branch is the one from Jesse. It's the Zerubbabel. Okay, listen to what happens. Zechariah 6, 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. Everybody thinks this is Jesus. It's not. It's whoever the modern day Zerubbabel will be. It even tells us. This is now, they're going to rule together when trumpets begins. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Okay? Who's building the temple of the Lord? Who was it in history? Who will do it in the prophetic future? Zerubbabel. Zechariah chapter 4. It's Zerubbabel who laid the foundation. It says, of this house and his hands shall also finish it. So who is Zerubbabel? Clearly, the one who's going to finish building the temple. So Zerubbabel is the branch. That's not Jesus. Who is Zerubbabel? Well, he's probably somebody alive right now. According to scripture, he's somebody alive. If the end of days are near, he is somebody alive right now. And you'll come to know who he is during the time of seals if you're here. Because he will be the one overseeing and leading the rebuilding of the, they're going to think they're going to be rebuilding the temple and everything, but they're only going to be the ones laying the foundation because then World War III and Antichrist and all that stuff then happens in the midst of all of it. So Zerubbabel is the branch, and what does it say? He's a Jew born in Babylon. 
So who's a Jew born in Babylon, say Babylon, New York, maybe? Who's a builder? Who's trying to, to get the temple and everything agreed upon and everything in Jerusalem so they could rebuild? I know of somebody who fits the bill. I've mentioned his name before. But imagine saying he's one of the two witnesses and he's going to be the one with the Lord ruling between the two of them. Sounds like insanity, doesn't it? Not according to what scripture says. Joshua, the high priest, the high priest and king Zerubbabel. What does it say about him? Well, we go to Psalms 110 and he's ruling in the midst of his enemies, right? Hello, that's because still trumpets time. While the branch, Zerubbabel, is going to be the one building the temple on the foundation that was already built. See, verse 13, even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon the throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Both. pretty wild to think there's somebody alive who's going to have his portion in building the temple while the Lord is there as high priest and king Melchizedek over the 144,000 wild stuff man that's some seriously wild stuff where was I I must have been in 15 right yeah all right so that's your root of Jesse, by the way. That's your root of Jesse. This is your, your Davidic line. We've shared many times that when we go back and you see in, um, in uh, 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 um, numbers, we see that Osi or Hosea, whose name is changed to Joshua Yeshua, is from Ephraim. Ephraim is part of Israel, the house of Israel, not the house of Judah. So knowing that the lion of the tribe of Judah, something else is going on that we, I don't yet have the full understanding of. But you see, the root of Jesse is Zerubbabel, and comma and he that shall rise is the one that's going to be over the Gentiles. Well, of course, who's the one bringing in the Gentiles? Who is the one in creation when he was made light was part of that creation of those in the days of light? They're the ones who are Mark. They're the ones who he came to shed his light on so that he could shed his light. And those who are of the spirit are the spirits. Those who are of the light are his. And those who are of the flesh are the fathers. Three groups. Everything is always in threes. And that's why in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, in verse 2, you saw in the Spirit of God was over the waters. The Spirit portion was first. John 1 tells us all these things. The second portion was the light in the days. And those days were to the Lord, which would be to us as thousands. And then the flesh was Adam and Eve. And the flesh is the 7,000 that were in, of which to the Lord, there seven days. You see? And he shall reign over the Gentiles. The Gentiles are those grafted in with the house of Israel. They're the ones spread out throughout all the nations. The only ones that are in Israel, in the land and in Jerusalem in that area... They're not all Israelites. They are not the house of Israel. They are only the house of Judah. That's why there's only about, what, 14, 15 million worldwide. Hello. Right? It says it all right there. Let's see this one. Verse 21. But as it is written, to whom he was spoken of, they shall see. Uh, uh, they shall see and they that have not heard shall understand. Okay, that's the mark group. <coughs> that's the mark group. This is through the group of seals. Why? Because he's going to reign over the Gentiles. 
he came to save the gentiles the the gentiles we always got to remember the gentiles were grafted in okay they are a part of the house of israel they're grafted in what else do we have all right and then check this out this is awesome because this is a picture now as we go into the end in Revel in uh, Romans 16 we know this part here in Romans 15 we see it as as Paul again as a typology of Christ which we know he plays many times a picture of Christ it's it's him talking having been in Jerusalem now as if he's been there for the 40 days and he's hoping now it's going to take hold okay and when we go to 16 we know who it's taking hold of. The entire story of Romans leads us to who that remnant portion of workers are. And what does it say? Romans 15, 30 and 31. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the Saints <coughs> so this typology of Christ that that he did this 40 days picture that he did to um, from uh, in Judea and in Jerusalem, that it's something that would be accepted for the saints. Well, where do we see the saints in tribulation? We see them in Revelation 13, right? What happens at about two and a half years? Antichrist gets his power. This is now when they've got to flee into the wilderness like Mark's. And it says in 13:7, Revelation 13, 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindred and tongues and nations. Sound familiar? It should sound familiar. This is what we were told, right? He's going to be given to all mankind through the fiery trials and tribulation. <clears throat> That's the Antichrist. And what is he given over? To make war with the saints. Here is verse 10 towards the end of it of Revelation 13. Here is the patience and faithfulness of the saints. In fact, let's read all of verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So there's your captivity. There's your killing. There's your sword. And what did it say? What did it say earlier in Romans? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall famine? Shall the captivity? Shall the sword? Shall death? Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So in Romans 15, as he's saying this, it's, it's like this picture of the end of 40 days coming and him saying, hopefully this is now going to be accepted among the saints. So his 40 days is coming to an end. His disciple remnant bride as his servant is there now as the light who, is gonna, who has received the light from him, who has the Holy Ghost, and now they're going out in the service of the Lord. Well, who are they? Who are they a picture of? Well, let's go see. Now what we're seeing is this picture of the end of the 40 days. This picture of this remnant worker who's now going to go out during seals. And we come into Romans 16, 3. And here they are. Greet Priscilla and Aquila my helpers in christ jesus okay remember aquila means eagle it's the good side of dan there's the other portion of the workers which are the ephraim portion that i believe are the the eagles of dan and the ephraim of the two sets like the two on the road to emmaus one represents twelve thousand ephraim and one represents 12,000 Aquila, okay, the eagle, the Dan on the good side, who have for my life laid down their own necks, okay? There's a group laying down their necks 
what did revelation 20 say those who were beheaded unto whom not only i give thanks but listen to this but all the churches of the gentiles just so happens there's a group of people pictured as priscilla and aquila who have the light of the lord who followed him who are receiving it as his remnant workers who are going to go out to all the churches of the gentiles and willingly put their necks on the line are you seeing the is to come yet who are they we know them very well don't we they're also a picture of john 24. john 24 we see the two on the road to emmaus these two on the road to emmaus are a picture of them we see the lord hangs out with them we see the lord um hangs out and has a meal with them of course we've covered all of this from luke chapter 12 when he says look as your lord when he goes to the wedding that when he returns you be ready when he knocks right be girded about in your light shining that when he returns he will sit down with you and eat and serve you he only does it to this group not to the one in mark 16 and not to the ones in matthew 28 this is the picture of the Priscilla's and Aquila's, the road to Emmaus, the two on the road, the, the Ephraim and the, and the Dan on the good side. This is them. And what does he do with them? He opens their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And remember, when we talked about this word understanding, it's the same word for understanding only found here in Luke, not the other gospels. And it's the one for understanding who the beast will be in the mark of the beast. It's incredible. And here they are. Okay. What does it say? Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in the name, in his name, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses. I send you the promise of my father. They're now going to tarry in Jerusalem. They're the picture of Priscilla and Aquila. We also see them in Luke chapter 21. For a little recap on who they are. You see, only in Luke do you see this. It'll be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But before all these, Marx is the nation against nation beginning. This but before is that whole 40, 50 day period before nation against nation, which is red horse rider. And what does it say? Before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, delivering up to synagogues, put you into prisons. Okay, brought before kings and rulers. Verse 16 of Luke 21. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you, they shall cause to be put to death, but not a hair of your head will perish. Okay? As soon as you're put on there, right, to be put to death, you won't feel a thing. Not a hair of your head will be harmed. You'll be instantly with the Lord. <clears throat> so who are these some of you? You guys all know this as I bring it to a close. We know these are the ones from Smyrna. Okay? It's all about, for anybody that's new, you can come watch, read about it in the Ministry Revealed book. If you want to buy it, you can buy it on Amazon if you like paperback. Otherwise, you can download the PDF for free. And it's in different languages, I think five different languages on the website. You can listen to it in audio. This right here is a picture of Ecclesiastes nine, uh, 1 verse 9. The was and the is in the is to come. The was played out over a couple thousand and change years. The is is playing out over 2,000 years. When it's over in the Laodicea, it will start over again in the seven churches and what was that took a couple thousand years, what is that took a couple thousand years, the is to come, will all be packed into 14 years. That is how chaotic the end of days will be. Ephesus represents the beginning of the 50 days in the above 14 years. This is when the apostles will be chosen, will be breathed on the Spirit, and the Lord will go um, to the wedding. 
when he returns from the wedding, these guys, the apost the apostolic group will be here. But when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day, he's going to meet with the Smyrna group. This is that Luke 24 group. This is that Luke 21, when the persecution and those where some of them will die. This is his remnant bride worker portion. Smyrna. This is the beginning of the 40 days when he returns on the eighth day after the seventh day wedding. Okay, they're here during at least seals. And this takes us to Pergamum, which is when Antichrist, about two and a half years into tribulation of the 14 years, this is the picture of Mark 13 when they're to flee into the wilderness. This is when Antichrist gets his power in Revelation 13 to continue 42 months. This is the fleeing. This is those 42 months. The dark ages while they're still in the wilderness. And this is when the Lord returns in that seventh year. The reformation. The beginning then of trumpets while he's the king of Israel. You see, as king of Israel, ruling over the Gentiles who are grafted in. Until mid-trumpets, Philadelphia is there. They have their portion. They're the 144,000 during the first half of trumpets until the cutting off, until the removal of Messiah when he's cut off at mid-trumpets, when Satan's cast down and the pit is opened. It's the removal now of Israel's kings. And it goes in to the end of trumpets, which is the final portion of the apostasy, which is the mid-trumpets, and the two and a half years with Satan being cast down, the pit open, Antichrist coming back, and the false prophet there. All three of them, which of course leads us back to why Revelation 16, 13 shows that all three of them are there at the end. And the first two that go into the pit are the Antichrist and the false prophet. Sorry, not into the pit, into the lake of fire. They're the first two where Satan is bound a thousand years until that millennial reign is over. Okay? It's Smyrna. They are his remnant worker bride. They are the Luke 21, Luke 24. They are the Romans 16 picture of Priscilla and Aquila putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles because they're working as the cover crop to bring in the spring wheat, to bring in the great multitude rapture. Listen to what it says about Smyrna. <clears throat> Um, verse nine, I know thy works and tribulation. See, again, it could have been Luke because there is no tribulation in the end time sense. Okay. It's them that remain to work. I know thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the them, I know, uh, and I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast, there it is, some of you. Just like, just like uh, Luke 21 and just like Daniel chapter 11 at the time of the first abomination. There's the some of you throughout before the abomination that some of you will be cast into prison and tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days, and be faithful unto death. Right? Put their necks on the line. And I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And here it is. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. There is only one group who is putting their necks on the line not taking the mark, willingly being beheaded, that won't feel it because not a hair of their head will be hurt. They will be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ. Did you remember they were the ones baptized by water? But the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Here it is to confirm it. On such, 
the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God, <coughs> excuse me, end of Christ, comma, end, shall, so they're going to be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with them a thousand years. The ones that reign with them are the ones that suffer with them. They are the ones that will be glorified together with him. They are the ones who will not be hurt by the second death. There is only one group, and they are Smyrna. And I opened with that great peace that the first will be the sign spread out in the sky. Then the sign of the trumpet. So Revelation 12, Luke 21, verse 25. Pre-trib, then the sign of the sound of the trumpet, mid-trib, at the time when he's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, which is the start of the seventh year, which is at this day and hour of Mark that no one knows, the sound of the trumpet, and the third, the resurrection of the dead, but not of all the dead. Why not of all the dead? Because not all will have part in the first resurrection. Only those who were co-heirs with Christ, who were willing to suffer as he suffered, to be glorified together as he was, so that they may be priests of God and of Christ, and as co-heirs shall reign with them the thousand years. Brothers and sisters, we have come to the end of Romans. Romans chapter 16. Here they are. They are the first fruits. They are the remnant worker first fruits. And let me close it out now. Starting from Romans 16 to the end. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them wow remember i said there's an is and there's an is to come maybe there's an is here for us right and and what would be the is to come when the lord opens the understanding of that remnant worker priscilla and aquila group who will willingly put their necks on the line that's the is to come when the Lord opens their understanding, as Luke 24 says. That's the is to come of it. But there's an is now as well, isn't there? For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Remember what I said. It's not easy to have discernment. You have to be diligent in his word and in prayer, seeking out his, the scriptures yourself. That's why I teach all of these things from the word and show you where I'm going and where it is so that you can go and discern for yourselves that these things are true. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Don't spend too much time and focus on these things of the enemy. Okay? Listen to this. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Hear that bride, that Gentile bride worker remnant? The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now listen as we close it out. Romans 16, starting in 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation. Who's the revelation, guys? Who received the revelation of that light? Remember this? The Luke 2 group. The Luke 2 group, and look who else. The Romans 16, 25 group, the, the end of Romans group. They're the same group. 
Here he is signing off at the end. Here it is at the end of the 40 days. Both of them are a picture of the end of the 40 days. Well, look where else it is. Let me show you this one. 1 Peter 1. Again, this is something we've proven, right? We've already shared this in 1 Peter. We know who it is. Look at this, starting in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed when? When? In the time of Christ? In, 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 in the last thousand years? 500? No. In the last time. A group who is kept, reserved in a place in heaven, who are kept by the power of God to be revealed in the end of days. That's exactly the group you're going to see. Wait till we go back to Romans 16 and end it. Look what 7 says. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When is this appearing? At his 40 days. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hello. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. How are you going to receive the end of your faith unless you're a part of his appearing? Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. You see, there's a requirement of searching diligently to be that, that remnant worker portion who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. We'll go to 13, verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angel desired to look into. So there's the is, but you're seeing this all in the is to come as well. And 13, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be uh, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is his 40 days. Who are the ones that were to be girded up? I showed you earlier. Who are the ones to be sober? Showed you earlier. It's his remnant worker when he returns from the wedding. Isn't that awesome? Well, let's let's tie it all together in a bow here as we finish here, Romans 16. So who are those according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret? Hello. And, and who are they? Well, according to the revelation of the mystery... So a group of people who were kept secret in a mystery since the world began. Well, who was it that were anointed and appointed from before the foundations of the world? You see, there's a duality. There's a dual thing going on here. It's not only the pre-trib group having been taken. It's the remnant portion that's remained. This remnant portion that are going to be this revelation, which is the 40 days of the Son of Man when he comes to shed his light. They're part of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. The remnant portion. But now is made manifest. Comma and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, here it is. Remember I told you? It was connected to the end that I had never seen it before 
until I had caught it by doing a prophetic understanding of all of Romans that we caught it in Romans 9 23 a group who he made known who were his vessels which were his remnant which will be his remnant worker bride to serve him who are the older who will serve the younger listen to what it says according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known so something now made known a group made known yes in the big picture of those who were all taken but now through those with them for 40 days being made known to all nations for the obedience of faith who were the made known guys who were the made known to all nations do you realize this group is going to be made known to all nations during the 40 days? Look at who they were in Romans 9. And when we went to the made known in the 11, right? In the, where is it? Where is it? In the 11, 20, what was it? In 11, 17 or whatever it was? Or 11, 07? Where was it? Where was it? There it is. Luke 2 15 it was the beginning of the 40 days the entire context is the remnant bride and the 40 days when the Son of Man returns after the pre-trib escape you see and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels a wife as contributing to the usefulness of her husband like the Leia type the older working for the younger as the winter wheat for the spring wheat as the cover crop winter wheat for the spring wheat of mercy which he had a four there's that a four which before the foundations he had prepared unto glory so what is this also saying these end time priscilla's and aquila's willing to put their necks on the line are now also made known to the nations for the obedience of faith not only everybody that's vanished pre-trib but so will this worker group how can i prove it out that it's also talking about the worker group because here's the 40 days of the son of man beginning listen to what happens in the 40 days okay here's the beginning of the 40 days but before all these they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to synagogues and to prisons being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake and it shall turn to you for a testimony settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what shall you shall answer for i will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends and some of you they shall be caused to be put to death but you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but there shall not be a hair of your head uh, that perish and in your patience possess you your souls this my friends as we have been teaching for years is the 40 days what's happening to them did you hear what it said about them but before all these they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you who shall lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up into synagogues and into prisons being brought before kings and rulers meaning across the earth you're going to be brought before kings and rulers and be put into prison but the lord is going to give you the words to speak through the power of his spirit how much more evidence do you need what did it say this group would happen so it's a picture of those that are gone, but also a picture of that portion of them that were chosen to stay. They were the ones made known. They're being now made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And what are they going to, what's going to happen to them through their obedience of faith? They're going to suffer the persecution. By who? All nations. What did it say? By kings and rulers all across the earth 
it's going to start right away. When the 40 days begins, guys, there is going to be persecution on that remnant bride, it would seem, almost immediately. Because the power and the authority given unto them, as the Lord said he would in Luke chapter 24, when he opens their understanding and they're with him. Wow. Brothers and sisters, Romans is such a treat, man. You want to talk about insight. You want to talk about just layered revelation for us in the book of Romans. It is over the top. It is absolutely crystal clear from the beginning to the end of Romans who the prophetic understanding in it is speaking to. It is absolutely incredible. I pray that it blesses you. For more, for anybody that's new, you can click these links right here. You can also do it when you're watching a video. You can go into the description box and find these links as well. But you can click right here. You can go directly to ministryrevealed.com or on the about page is where it takes you. You can see our GoFundMe, our website, our PayPal for support. Here is our Facebook where we're also um, uh, uh, posting our short videos that you can share and repost to others. And our Twitter where they're being posted as well by our sister Trisha. You can also take them and you can retweet them as well. So on top of reposting Facebook, on top of reposting our tweets in relation to the shorts of YouTube, you can also, if you're so led, repost them on your channels as well. And let's get the word out, brothers and sisters. God is good. The spirit is most certainly leading. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. And I believe the next one will be a live show where we will discuss this and so much more. I love you. God bless you and yours. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.